are few places more beautiful in the world than America, and few places prettier than North Carolina. It is a time to be proud, a time when all Americans are standing tall, a time to give thanks. It is also a time to be ashamed, a shame that this proud and rich land has so many without, and that so many of those are children. When most of us see a house like this, we don't really stop to think much about who might live here. Well, these days it's likely a child might call this home. One out of every four American children is poor. Think of it. One out of every four children you meet could be poor. It is not a black problem, not a white problem. It is an American problem, our problem. Tonight, we will meet some of our American neighbors who are experiencing the pain of poverty firsthand the symptom of an illness that threatens us all. We will hear their stories and learn about their lives. And perhaps in doing so, we'll learn a little about ourselves. below the poverty line in 1984, down to 14% even in 1985. But critics pointed out there are still 33 million Americans living in poverty. Shasha is five and Sandra is 10. Their mother, Ann Tillery, is 27 years old. The Tillery family has always been poor. My father was named Sandy Tillery, and he died in farm work. My mother was named Lily Bell Tillery, and she also died from farm work. And both of them are dead. Here you go. I bet you don't know who will bake the cake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I bet you don't know who will bake the cake. Mr. Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Riley Snake. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. This is Connie Tillery, Anne's sister. At 26 years old, she has four children. Felicia is 11, Michelle is five, Brandy is eight, and the baby Lulu is three years old. No, my mama, when I was coming up, you know, she used to drink, you know, and do. She'll sit down and cry about how she had a hard time, you know. I said, oh, ain't nothing wrong with mom. She ain't nothing but drunk, you know, that's why you said, hmm, I see what she was crying about. She won't lie, it's a hard time, so sure you. Connie's kids have never had much of anything. You are seeing the best house in which think, they've ever lived. Do you think there could be a sad story about snow? Who is a sad story about snow? Connie and the kids lived their own sad story here last year. Like we ain't got enough wood. Like, like, like right now, this great big snow kind. We ain't had no wood. I was trying to say, Lord, I remember we were going free. They survived, but it wasn't easy. This shack has paper-thin walls and no running water. Buckets of human waste sat in the children's bedroom. The Tillery family has plenty of company. Half of all black American children are poor and almost nine million white children. A total of 14 million poor American children. That number has been growing rapidly over the past four years, so fast, in fact, we could now populate an entire third world country with just our poor children. The suffering is here. All too easy to find. Can't hardly make no money to buy no food. And can't no bathroom, half of a kitchen, half of a living room. Are they going to have the money to do the things with it they want to? I hope that they And it'll make you cry. It'll make you feel real bad knowing your children want something you can't get it from. When it was cold, the kids, like, they didn't, they couldn't, they never stayed warm. They just buy it that we got to scrubble and, and hustle and, and try to raise our children the best way we can. Anne 
and her kids live in the back of an old store. Dine, get up. They pay rent out of the welfare check they get and buy groceries with the food stamps they receive. Breakfast looks pretty good at the beginning of the month, but a few weeks in, things begin to change. The meals are much leaner. The money runs out. I think the total for two children and one person is $246 a month. I tell you, you don't never have nothing to spend on yourself or buy something for the children. You always got to... You always got to pay bills with it. He came out rocking. And you know, the children go in the stores and they want something. But you just don't have it for the bathroom. Down the road at Connie's, the kids had nothing more than government surplus cheese to eat for lunch. Sometimes they don't even get lunch. Hundreds of miles away from Tillery in Boston, Massachusetts, experts released an alarming report on hunger. A physician's task force headed by the Harvard University School of Public Health concluded that malnutrition in the United States rivals that of the third world and that an estimated 20 million Americans at some time or another during the month go to bed hungry. Hunger in America at the present time is serious enough to be termed a national health epidemic. Harvard professor Larry Brown headed the hunger task force. He learned 15 million Americans eligible for food stamps and other food giveaway programs don't get them. He thinks it's intentional. The barriers to participation in food stamps, I think, have been carefully constructed. I think the, the fact that many people who need and are eligible for the program aren't getting it is the outcome of conscious and planned efforts. Brown says the government intentionally keeps people from getting food stamps by making the process so complicated and frustrating people just give up. Well, I've been here an hour and a half and I've moved about 150 feet maybe. They want to know everything, every car, every whatever you got, they want to know. So I'll do just like this. If you on food stamp and welfare, you ain't got no privacy. Just got to fill out so many forms and ask you so many questions when you go up there. The government saves money when people like Ann, who are entitled, drop out. After all, if everyone who could went on food stamps, it would cost an additional $8 billion a year. We already spend $19 billion. However, we give away more money than that in foreign aid. An average food stamp family here gets about 49 cents per person per meal. Is there enough food around the house for you? Not all the time, but sometimes. People living on a level at, of food stamp purchases for food will become malnourished. If adequate nutrients aren't there for that brain while it's being developed, the brain will, will weigh less in grams, uh, there will be fewer brain cells, and we will be producing retardation. The health problems are already here. Pat Hayes is 35 years old. Her son, Terry, was born in February. He has been sick all his life, and his mother isn't well. My health is poor. I have ulcers, gallstones, and I might have cancer of the uterine, or uterus. Like so many poor people, Pat's illnesses are more frequent and more severe, yet she has to rely on the county health department for medical care. The lines are long, the wait even longer. It just puts you through a hassle. A lot of times you might be sick and you don't feel like having to go through all that, but you, you have to do it in order to get help from the government like that. And you saw the doctor Monday, you say? Dr. Thigpen told me he had some kind, something wrong with his stomach, like a nervous stomach. Pat is here today because Terry hasn't been able to keep down any food. Just keep the feeding as simple as possible. 
no cereal, no fruit juice, no baby foods, nothing. I know a lot of times, though, if I don't feed him, or give him his baby food, mm -hmm. he'll squall, squall, squall. I give him his milk, he don't want it. Give him that baby food and he'll take it. And he'll hush. Pat goes through this counseling session with a nutritionist in order to get WIC coupons, specialized food stamps for high-risk women, infants, and children under five. The coupons can be used like money in the grocery store to buy a limited list of items, milk, eggs, and other foods the government thinks high-risk children ought to have. The coupons don't stretch that far, and Pat, more than once, has found herself without food. Well, that situation you don't forget. You worry, especially if you got children. Wonder how, what you're going to do to get them something to eat. Pat's children haven't had to go without for long, but there have been cases of children starving to death. Many tombstones bear the names of poor children. They are twice as likely to die violent deaths, more likely to be murdered or to see their parents die, less likely to see their 18th birthday. At 10 months old, Connie's last child, Michael, died choking on a hot dog. You know, we did what we know, you know, about folks that beat them in the back and turn them upside down and all that. I'll never get over it. I'm gonna be sitting down in the house some night, think about that thing, and I just go to crying. Connie couldn't call for help. She has no phone, and she doesn't own a car. Connie watched her only son, Michael, die in her arms. Shasha is just beginning school, kindergarten in one of the poorest school districts in the state. Her class shares a room with first graders, and the noise spills over. Can't get up on the building if you don't put some steps in there. On your page, on page 10, you see that line going from east to west. That's the line they're talking about. It goes through the primary reading. You see that line right there at the center of it, you will see a zero. Right here, you see this zero? This is the line they're talking about right here. Felicia is in the fifth grade. So is her first cousin, Zandra. Both say they want to graduate from high school. Neither of their mothers did. And Zandra's mother dropped out in ninth grade. I guess I like to see for them to do better than what I'm doing. To go to school and finish school and get an education. And I don't want to see them get pregnant like I did when I was young. Teenage pregnancy is one major reason poor young women drop out of school. Anne's situation is not uncommon. After I had my oldest daughter, I stayed out so much, and when I came back, most of my friends had I left me. <clears throat> so I just didn't want to go back. Connie didn't go back either. At 15 and pregnant, she dropped out in seventh grade. And I worried so bad about my children, they're going to do that, you know, have babies before they even get, before they even get in, the, in the 20s and all that stuff, like I was, you know, I was... Young, my mom and dad didn't teach me nothing right from wrong. Connie and Ann don't want their children to end up the way they did, but they probably will. It's a cycle the government hasn't been able to stop, and one the community perhaps hasn't paid enough attention to. Ready to sing? That's all.
During the summer months, the kids flocked to Vacation Bible School at the community church. The families of most of these children, despite their hardships, have a great deal of faith. If you have faith, good things will happen to you. This is how Jesus is going to build that faith. Many of them still rely on the church, you know, to the church and the leaders to give, you know, the kids this sense of direction. Look. Oh, that's pretty. That is pretty. Beautiful picture. Like Shasha, most of the children here are poor, and yet there are no organized programs through the church to help them deal with their poverty. It is, according to some, a failing of the church. The church has got to understand that it needs to address the physical needs of a person's life as well as the spiritual need. It's awfully hard for you to tell me about God loving me when I'm hungry. Is your faith growing now? Do you feel about yourself and the people around you differently today than you did two days ago when you started vacation Bible school? You should. Have you been the church does what it can with what it has. Many members of this church are poor and donations are slim at best. This small rural church gets no help from its wealthier counterparts elsewhere. God still works miracles, but uh, people are waiting for him to part the Red Sea again. You know, and that day is gone. The miracles are worked through us. We are his instruments. Out. Gary Grant is what some people would call an activist. He is what others would call a community leader. Nonetheless, as a former teacher and member of the school board, he takes a great deal of interest in the children. You know, if you tell a child long enough he's dumb, he will be dumb. If you tell a person long enough that uh, this is all you're supposed to be able to do, he will believe that. And that's basically what has happened. They have no hope in them in themselves. And we have to give that hope. Grant is trying to do that by giving the kids a place to go, a place where someone takes an interest in them. Through donations and government grants, Tillery now has a community center. These young men built the basketball court. May not look like much, but it is something they did. A goal they achieved on their own. You have to build a foundation to start out in order to get them to put that hope and dream in them. But there has to be a commitment from the individual. We ride by and say, that's not my problem. It is my problem. There is hope here. The community center is here and the boys built the basketball court. They can do if just given the chance. <laughs> Farm work is just about the only thing you can do around Tillery to make any money. There are more workers than there are farmers. Ann and the kids made just over $3 one day picking cucumbers. By law, she will have to report those earnings to the government, and it will be deducted from her welfare check. Now, what kind of craziness is it in, the, in America when we hurt people who are trying to struggle to get back on their feet and help their own families and society? It doesn't make sense. A person can receive ADC, aid to dependent children, and make more money than they can by going to work every day. Now something is wrong. Anne volunteers her time taking the blood pressure of senior citizens at the community center once a week. Earlier this year, she completed a nurse's aid program, and right now she's looking for that kind of work. We caught her just before a job interview. Okay. Get out the door. I'm not nervous, sorry. Oh, no. She ain't picking up a three See, y'all gonna huh? get back. No. Anne 
drove over 20 miles to get to her interview that day. She did not get the job. It was a lot of people they interviewed, and, and most of them, the interview had already done that kind of work before. So I guess that's probably why. But, um, you know, I was disappointed, but I won't really let down because that's the first interview I had that, uh, from what I went to a nursing assistant had. So if I get one, I can get another one, I hope. I didn't finish school, and every time you look through the newspaper for a job, they're looking for an HR, I mean, a uh, high school diploma and all that kind of stuff. Somebody with some training, and I ain't had no training of nothing, no more than working in the fields and warehouse and stuff like that. If you get a job, the job is not paying enough for you to buy a car, so you still got to pay someone to take you. So you're still in poverty because that's taking more than what you would get if you sat home and got unemployment or something. Transportation is one of the biggest problems out here. If you're lucky enough to have a car like Ann, it's old and on its last leg. And then there's gas. You got to have money to make money. My hand ain't gonna never get mad. He ain't gonna get mad already, no. It's still great. Connie and her sister Ann are both single mothers. There are no daycare centers around here, so even if they found work, they wouldn't have anyone to take care of their kids. From where they sit, there is no way out. Can you remember that awful feeling you get inside when you fail? A mindset that says you just aren't good enough, or smart enough, or pretty enough or wealthy enough. Well, that's the feeling Connie and Anne and millions of Americans like them get all the time. We, in a way, have contributed to those feelings through government programs that don't work, through donations that aren't enough, through opportunities that just aren't there. And the worst part is, it seems to be unstoppable, a never-ending cycle without hope. I just found it long ago. Never to walk in any one shadow if I fail. Felicia wants to move away from Tillery into a house she owns. She wants a family. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. She wants to be a teacher. The others have their secret hopes too. It's hard for them to keep those hopes alive when they are surrounded by so much despair. It would be easy for them to go the wrong way, or they were kind of brought up that way, and they live with it around them every day. In a tight vote tonight, the House approved the bill to give Contra Rebels $100 million in American aid. Shows, uh, Lord, you need to wash your feet. At the Capitol, administration officials made the same pitch, warning that without military aid, the future is bleak for Nicaragua's Contra. The future of the Tillery family is also bleak. Two generations of poverty is likely to mean future generations of poverty, despite the faint hope. I want to see them, you know, do better what I'm doing. They don't have dreams, and the dreams that they have had have been destroyed. Yeah, but come and hear something. And they've become complacent and shut into the cycle in which they're in, and they can't the adults can't give their children dreams. See you in the morning, Shasha. And therefore, the cycle just repeats itself over and over. No one says, hey, I deserve better, or hey, I, I can have better. These children don't even know what better means. For every fourth child, there is poverty of hope.